one of the things that we look at when we think about the industry and we think about uh, the future is are, are there tools that are going to change things? And there are a lot of new things out there that prospectively could, but there's also changes in the dynamic of the industry uh, as a result of local events. And one big event that happened in New York is that the very largest market shareholder, the a &P company, disappeared. And that led to a tremendous rejuggling of, um, of stores and banners and market share in the area. And I think it, it seems appropriate um, to start out. Uh, Marianne, le let me ask you this. Um, how is the industry different? How is retailing different post a and in, in New York metro area? I think the area is different post a and because of the closure of those stores, the absorption of those stores by other retailers. But I also think that change is coming because customers' needs are different. They didn't necessarily go to a different supermarket when a and closed. They went to different um, areas, the dot-coms, the shopping from home, and that's the thing that we have to keep up with now. Now that everything's shuffled out and most of the store locations have either changed name or closed, um, the new way of doing business is to appeal to what everyone in our area needs. Delivery at home, shopping from home, um, prepared meals delivered that can be made at home. And as a supermarket, we need to satisfy all of those needs. Well, you know, it's interesting because Eric she seems to be setting you up pretty perfectly. Um, but then again, I, I, I'm reading the paper yesterday and Amazon announced that they're gonna do a new convenience store that um, isn't gonna have cashiers, it's all gonna come on our, an app and we'll be able to walk through the store and, and buy everything. What, what is the, the technological change that's gonna drive the industry? Sure. Um, I, I think there's obviously vast technological change, um, you know, but delivering a book is not the same as delivering a banana. Um, really trying to figure out, um, as a food company, how to deliver fresh uh, produce and, and fresh food altogether um, is, is, a, is an extreme challenge, and it's one that we think at Fresh Direct we've, we've figured out. Um, and continuing to... Um, innovate on things like our, our we have a new uh, business called Food Kick uh, where we deliver in an hour. People want everything now and uh, but they also you know at, at the core they want fresh food and they want to know where it comes from so um, we're going to continue to to do that. Okay what I'd like to do now is just quickly go through the um, the chairs if you will and let each one of you just give a, a moment about yourself and introduce yourself let people know how you came to be sitting on this stage. Uh, Rich, why don't you start us out? How did I get to sitting on this stage? Uh, okay, we won't say that. <laughs> uh, Rich Dackman, I'm with Cisco. Uh, four decades in the industry uh, and just, just always proud to kind of represent the food service segment of our business. Mark. Mark Goldman, I'm the produce director for Morton Williams Supermarkets. I've been in industry 38 years. Okay. Chris. Chris Keach with All Hold USA, produce category director. I've been there for six years in the produce industry for 24 years. Sitting on the stage through the passion that we've heard so much about through, you know, Jim and some of the folks that, other folks that have talked and also my respect for Susan's dad, John. Terrific. Paul. Uh, Paul Neeland from Our Holds Fresh Formats Division. Uh, very excited to be here. Love this show. Love this event. Uh, this is my first year here, though. <laughs> it's, a, it's a phenomenal, phenomenal show. Uh, looking forward to it. Uh, Amy. Amy Lance from Waitrose in the UK. Um, we're an employee-owned retailer. Um, I've taken a year out of my day job to get to know the supply chain a bit better. So I've been working with growers in South Africa, Senegal, and the US. Um, taking a step away from retail. Uh, Amy uh, gave a wonderful presentation yesterday at our Global Trade Symposium. Uh, she has great pictures she could show you uh, of her in the dirt in Senegal sorting chilies and picking them and 
uh, it's, it would be very interesting and maybe a very different industry uh, if every retailer uh, spent a year picking chilies out there in Senegal. Eric. I'm Eric Stone. I head up uh, Perishables, so the fresh departments at Fresh Direct here, uh, an online grocery store in the area. Vic. Oh, I think his mic's not on Vic. Vic Savinello. Maybe it's just too far away. Vic Savinello, Director of Produce and Floral for Allegiance Retail Services. Um, the cooperative that uh, services uh, the Food Town, D'Agostino, Banners, amongst a few others. Um, I've been in the industry for 37 years, first job I ever had. Um, and I'm the president of the Eastern Produce Council, obviously. Hey, Anthony. Anthony Sattler, CNS Wholesale Grocers. Um, I've been with CNS since 1997, and um, I'm the vice president of produce. Marianne. I'm Marianne Santo, category manager for Wakefern Food Corporation. I've been there for 31 years, and I'm the first vice president of the Eastern Produce Council. Josh. Uh, Josh Padilla. I've been in produce for 17 years. I'm uh, basically the produce director and coordinator for Crasdale Foods. Fantastic. You know, when Eric uh, concluded his statement, he, he said that what people want is fresh food. Rich, I'd like to ask you, you know, is it true that what people want today is fresh food, or do they want meals fully made and delivered to them? Well, home delivery is becoming a big part of what people do. I think the best answer to that question is um, everybody's crazy busy, busier than they've ever been. Uh, uh, everybody works, couples work, um, and everybody's looking for convenience uh, and, and things happening fast. Uh, the fastest growing segment of the produce or the restaurant industry is fast casual, which you walk in, you order your food, you sit down and you get it quickly. Uh, fresh is a big part of that. Uh, I think the, uh, the home delivery is, is kind of addresses both those things. It's, it's quick and it also uh, gives people an experience, which I think is really important because I think, um, and I'm proud to say I'm seeing younger people uh, want to experience food and fresh is a big part of that. And so uh, the, the opportunity to be creative at home and, and, and cook together and experience that together, um, uh, I, I think it's a segment that's, that's gonna grow and uh, I think it's great because people can interact with each other and eat healthy food. Paul, you've been very involved in a new and innovative um, small store concepts. And, and, you know, one of the questions is, can the industry get closer to people, be more integrated in their lives? Um, what are you finding in terms of consumer response to these idea of very micro neighborhood stores? Well, it's, a, it's been a fantastic journey so far. Um, we're learning a lot about the millennial shoppers who have moved back to the cities, who don't buy cars, who are not willing to buy a house, not going to get married anytime soon. Their shopping patterns are completely different than what I've witnessed in the, in the suburbs. Um, technology is certainly part of it. Uh, Eric spoke about it a little bit. Uh, we uh, just started um, a scan and shop. You see scan and shop in some of the stop and shop stores and giant stores. But uh, the scan and shop now with your smartphone. So you can go through with your smartphone, scan everything and, uh, on an app and, and just go out the door that way. So uh, Amazon just came out with these, these, this new store, this new concept store with uh, no cashiers. Um, we have to be mindful of the technology that's going on right now that, that is actually creating more opportunities for the fresh end of things uh, from the, for the new shopper. So as an industry from the supply side all the way to retail, I, I believe that we need to kind of get together and say what is going to make uh, shoppers buy more wholesome fresh food. The millennials are looking for clean food. They're looking for fresh. Um, big focus on, on produce. Huge, huge amount of our business is in produce. And um, certainly have to take that all the way through the entire supply chain. Amy, 
is product enough, though? You know, coming from uh, the UK, uh, which on most surveys reports as a uh, uh, more socially aware market than many markets in the United States, um, but also perhaps a bit of a forward-thinking market. You've been doing this deep dive into the supply chain. When selling product beyond the quality of the product itself, what are you finding that UK consumers are looking for? And do you feel the industry is delivering in terms of other concerns, labor and whatever it might be, environmental, et cetera? Yeah, I think um, the, UK, the UK consumer definitely has a, a good understanding of, um, well, hopefully in some instances where the product is coming from, but they, they want socially um, responsible product as well as good quality. Um, that's definitely something that we see as uh, Waitrose as a supermarket. Um, of course, um, Waitrose is about 5% uh, of the market. Um, there's, there's many other products out there where actually maybe the first thought that the customer has isn't a, about is the product being, is the product socially um, responsible? Is it being um, responsibly sourced? Um, throughout the last seven months, I've seen um, many different production methods um, and many different scale um, farms. Um, I personally think that being socially aware is very important, um, but um, there's obviously a long way to come for, for, for some places in the world as well. Um, I think one of the most important things that I've found over the last seven months um, is actually from a retailer perspective, the importance of being socially aware and wanting those things, but also um, giving back to those farms in terms of programming, in terms of giving um, strong indications of what we want, um, as well as the farm giving us what we want um, at, at the same time. So I think, I think, um, I think there's um, two things to think about. Okay, the farm's gonna be socially responsible, that's great, but also what the retailer can give back to that farm um, to make sure that they know what the retailer wants. Anthony, it must be a challenge. Um, CNS is a giant procurement uh, operation. H how do you manage to um, ensure that the people you're dealing with on the supply side are able to deliver more than just the product, but in fact conform to all the other expectations you have, food safety, sustainability, traceability, all, all these type of things. And how do you manage to be competitive and keep your retailers competitive uh, when other people maybe don't do all those things? Well, we have a team of national buyers who are uh, true experts in their field, um, whether it's a, a, a strawberry buyer, a western veg buyer, a watermelon buyer. Um, they get out to the fields, um, they meet with the growers, they know exactly, uh, they're working three and four weeks ahead, they know kind of yields are going, to, um, are, are going to come, whether it's a high yield, low yield. And with that, we speak to our customers daily, weekly. Uh, we're always ahead of the market. Um, and uh, we, we have uh, very strong ties with our, with our retailers. And we keep them, uh, keep them competitive and, and ahead of those markets. Let me ask you this, Chris. Um, you have an advantage over some of the people here in that your stores are your stores and you can um, more directly guide them on what they're supposed to carry and, and things of this sort. H how can you use that control uh, in the service of getting um, new items uh, into the stores and into the hands of consumers and in general trying to boost produce consumption sales? Well, I think it's a two-way street. So it's our partnership with the suppliers that are bringing these new products to market, and then the partnership that we have with each division and the operations teams in those divisions to help execute the speed to shelf that we need in order to stay ahead of the competition, ahead of trends, so on and so forth. Okay. Mark, um, how did, um, we talked a little bit about A&P uh, disappearing, and, and you, you got some benefit from, uh, from that happening. H how has that changed your company? Well, we've added um, three stores that, we, that used to be food emporiums, and it's increased our volume a lot, uh, buying power. Um, we have stores in a lot of different neighborhoods, so we try and cater to each neighborhood. 
and it just it increased everything. Really, it's it's very very good for us. Do, do you um, do you find that uh, the customers of another store, in this case the food emporiums, uh, remain loyal, or do is there a sort of reshuffling when a new person takes over? It always reshuffles, and um, normally when we take over the stores, we've been remodeling them also as we go, and it's a little rough to remodel while you're open, mm -hmm. but we do that, and it seems to have worked out very well. It's a little rough at the beginning, but it works out, and mm -hmm. most of the customers seem very happy with what we've done, especially the remodeling, because a lot of the food emporium stores were kind of getting old and dated, um, and we've updated <clears> them, <throat> and we carry much more variety. I know in produce we do, and also in deli, prepared foods. We try and cater to, to Manhattan. Most of the stores are in Manhattan. We try and cater to the people in Manhattan. It's a lot of grab and go, <clears throat> prepared foods, prepared meals, uh, cut vegetables, cut fruit, whatever we can do. And every neighborhood's different, so we try and cater to the neighborhood also. Um, we're not as big as A&P or Food Emporium was, so every store's not the same. Mm -hmm. so we try and be different. Vic, um in theory, if you have an undercapitalized, struggling retailer who gets out and new, more vibrant people with new ideas, new money come in, we might be able to do a better job for consumers and actually see people buy more fruits and vegetables. You think that's happened? I don't know whether they've, um I don't know whether they are buying more fruits and vegetables. I really can't say that, that, that that's the case. And you know, we had this whole conversation the last couple of days about increasing consumption, and there's more to it than just um, than price, and um, there's more to it than just having being new or, or being a little bit of a better operator. It, it's giving people um, choices and, and options and, and driving them to consume more by giving them different um, ideas on how to use the products. Um, but the, the one thing, to, to, and I think this is what your question is, is that this new competition made all of us better. Um, better at our operations, um, better as far as a competitive nature, as far as writing our ads. Um, with this new competitor coming into the market, um, trying to outthink what everyone else is going to do to compete with that new competitor that has a little bit of a different posture when it comes to advertising. Um, that, I would say, definitely, in my opinion, drove... I think produce consumption because we got very aggressive with our pricing. Mm -hmm. um, might not have brought up the dollars, but I would guess it brought up the tonnage. Josh, you work with a lot of independent store owners, um, and for the most part we have a few of them who will come to an event like this, but yeah, they think of themselves mostly as grocers, not produce people, because you know, that's one of the, or just one of the things they sell. But among those independent owners, do you think there's any um, opportunity for the industry to intercede and make them more focused, more passionate about moving more produce? Well, well we've, we've seen among a lot of our independents and where they've taken notice is they've actually started shrinking center store down a little much more, inc basically increasing the footprint of the produce department. Um, also, at the same time, you have a lot of uh, store owners um, of the independents and where they're different ethnicities, and so you have Korean store owners that cater to their own neighborhoods and know how to do that the right way, and also um, <coughs> Hispanics, basically um, store owners that sort of cater to their clientele. So what we, ha what we have to do as far as an industry um, to sort of get them to consume more produce uh, is basically try to market to them much a little bit much more uh, on ways of uh, consuming produce, different brands, maybe some more outreaches, um, you know, basically, for example, avocados from Mexico, do commercials on, on, um, on basically on TV, uh, but it's only on basically English speaking channels, not on Hispanic channels. So there is some opportunity as, as an industry to sort of go out and, and, and bring some of the ethnicities and the different independents out there. What, what about you, Mary? And you know, Wakeford's really the, the giant in this marketplace, uh, and you depend heavily on uh, the power of your store owners and the willingness of your store owners to engage. I was very pleased to see, um, I, I know we had some of the Insera family come to this event, and some of your ownership groups. Uh, I've seen that increase over the last seven years. Do you think the owners of the stores are more interested in produce than they were? 
10 years I, ago? I think they are. I think they're more interested in promoting local and sustainable, and they're more in directly involved in that. I also think that now more than ever, they learn from each other and best practices when it comes to produce transfer from one owner to another. Um, we just had a meeting yesterday, and one of our owners showed a kiosk that they have in front of each produce department now allowing people to take a piece of fruit for their children while they're shopping. And that became pretty exciting in the meeting and other owners are gonna to look to mirror that. So I think that's how they learn from each other and it engages all of them more so. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing. A lot of supermarkets will have things like a cookie program where any child can come to the bakery and get a cookie. Uh, wouldn't it be really nice and in line with the values that so many stores are looking to promote if you could come and get an apple uh, as well as a cookie or instead of a cookie. And maybe um, that's something we can work on uh, in the uh, industry. Um, Amy, one of the trends here in America is smaller stores. And we were talking to Paul a little bit about his area. But that's been a, a situation in the UK for a long time with people having you know, express versions of, of their stores. Um, how is the consumer reaction to these uh, type of smaller format stores, particularly in reference to uh, their fresh offerings? Uh, it's an interesting concept to look at. At Waitrose, um, we, we're certainly not the biggest in terms of convenience stores. Uh, we've looked at convenience stores um, with a slightly different site to other retailers. Um, we've tried to um, help the consumer try to really understand um, the, the convenience store by plotting their mission as you walk through the store. So actually, instead of uh, working with a standard store format, we've tried to think about what the consumer is going in the store to purchase in terms of a meal. And we've plot, plotted the uh, convenience store in terms of that meal occasion. So starting with the produce, going round, getting the poultry, and then finishing off with the liquor. So actually, it's more of a journey. And um, we've had really good response to that. But of course, there's, there's lots of different convenience stores formats in the UK. Um, Tesco Express have been very successful and uh, on every street corner. Um, but Waitrose have tried to do things slightly differently. We're, we're centered in London, um, but actually looking at the customer mission and actually tracking that around the store has worked well for us. Rich, restaurants for a long time have tried to track the customer mission, why they're coming to, to that particular store. There have been initiatives, PMA was very involved in a, an initiative with the National Restaurant Association, the Institute. Institutional Food Service Deliver Distributors Association, all with this goal of trying to increase consumption of produce through restaurants. And it's a big concern to the industry, not just because we'd like the food service industry to buy more, but it sets a, a sampling program almost for all the retailers. If people go to restaurants and they try new fruits and vegetables um, and they like them, that's going to increase retail sales without any doubt. But isn't the vast majority of produce that's sold to restaurants still just a few items? And how can we get restaurants to be more interested in, in moving a lot of other items that might help the overall consumption level by increasing the sampling component? It's a, it's a good question. We've, as an industry, have had a lot of efforts in consumption all the way from healthy child's meals, which is really where it evolves to try to get our young folks understanding how to eat healthy food. And I think we're continuing to focus on that a lot. Um, so the question is how to get more produce in people's mouths. And, so, and, and there's a big focus in the industry right now on innovative items. Um, and uh, I know Cisco and FreshPoint are introducing a lot of innovative items to the industry as is our competitors. Uh, as the cauliflower crumbles that were mentioned this morning. Brussels sprouts have gone crazy. Beets are going nuts. Uh, and I think the chefs are really looking for, for new items. And you're absolutely right. Uh, the, the evolution of innovative produce items starts with the chef. And then someone comes to a restaurant, eats it, and they want to go to a grocery store and say, where do I, you know, I found this, I ate it, I want it. Um, 
I still believe that's a bit of the romantic side of the business. I'm not sure it's actually going to push huge volume in, in overall consumption, but I absolutely see uh, even the larger chain type restaurant trying to be more creative on what they put on the plate, almost trying to compete with each other to, to get that more high-end uh, consumer into their locations. So I actually see a, a, a great positive in that way. And I think we, as a food service industry, we hold a responsibility to try to uh, get these new items in. And I love when I see it ultimately graduate into a popular item from something uh, that uh, I was recently in Salinas and I was going through some Brussels sprouts fields and I was completely blown away at the volume compared to what it was just 10 or 15 years ago. So uh, these things happen, the progression is there. Eric, when um, internet shopping first came out, one of the thoughts was the advantage that internet shopping had with things like Amazon and books was this long tail that um, you know a bookstore can only hold so many of the books available, but on the internet, you could have every book that was ever available, available today to buy. Does that work in food? Can, can um, uh, internet shopping provide uh, varieties and choices that are hard for a retailer to provide? Uh, I mean, the answer is yes, um, but it's still, you, you know, each item you have to manage, it's a fresh item. Um, the, the opportunity is really consumer facing where you can recommend items that may be hidden in other produce departments. Um, where uh, one example that we use is a star rating system where we have our uh, operational team rate every product from one to five stars in each day. And when we rate something five stars, it'll change the uh, location on the page. And, and the, the rating is uh, organoleptic based on the flavor and the profile. And maybe it's something new and innovative that we want to get into people's carts. Um, but rating at five stars, you see the lift. Um, and, and we, people said that we were crazy at first being able to rate products lower two stars, but if it's out of season and it's inconsistent, uh, we will do that. Um, and we've gained loyalty that way uh, and, and people follow it. Um, so that's one, one way. Um, but, uh, you know, we can sample product, we can put it in people's boxes uh, when uh, they may have a high affinity towards a particular item. Uh, and we can do all these things, and, and the um, online space it provides that. Um, although, to your point, uh, can you have an unlimited number of items, it would be hard to manage in a fresh uh, environment. Um, Chris, Ahold has uh, long been involved with online delivery as well. and. Uh, uh, a lot of people feel that the future is not one or the other, and in fact, Amazon's thought that they should open 2,000 little convenience stores kind of adds to that uh, idea. And people talk about you know, brick and click and all these things. How, how has Ahold managed to integrate uh, the appeal of having a physical store and also uh, working an online system? Yeah, I think it's... Uh it's a marriage made in heaven to a certain extent, just because you have your core group of customers that have always been store shoppers, the ones that want to be there to pick out their own produce. But now a lot of those stores have Peapod ware rooms as part of their operations where shoppers are going down onto the sales floor and shopping the same products, the same displays that customers coming in from the street are shopping. So. I think that kind of builds an affinity and a, and a sense of trust is, you know, especially some of the higher customer traffic stores, customers see Peapod associates shopping for customers that are then gonna stop by the store and pick it up on their way home from work or deliver to their doorstep. Um, but I agree with you, I don't think it's going to be one or the other, it's how the two marry up and then interact with each other. And I, I think for retailers that have already a foot into the, to the online arena, I think have a leg up on on some of the others that don't. Vic, when, when you're working with your stores and they're in this brave new world where there is Fresh Direct and they, there's Click and Brick and all, all this, how do they respond to this and how, how do they see their place evolving in the food environment? Well, I'm, when, you're, when you're talking about the, um, the ability to shop that way, everyone in this industry that's a supermarket or, or retailer 
definitely has a, a program at some level or another that they're trying to develop and develop to be greater and, and to, to be able to do the same things that you know, all of our competition are, are doing. Some of our, you know, as being part of a co-op, some of our members are more aggressive with it, some of them are less. Um, some of them because of where they are in, um, in the marketplace, whether it be stores in Manhattan versus stores in North Jersey or wherever, they, they take a little bit more of, of, or put a little bit more uh, importance level to it. But anyone that's ignoring this forum is, in this industry um, is crazy. I mean, it, it's there, it's here, it's not going away. It's gonna continue to compete with us and um, we need to be able to find a way to compete with it. So everyone is participating in it. Well, Mark, with Manhattan-based stores, you're sort of at the epicenter of a lot of this online uh, competition. But do you actually find that um, you lose shoppers to this? Or is it shoppers <laughs> buy more than they used to buy because it's more convenient? Do shoppers still enjoy coming in sometimes to a store? What, what do you find is the uh, feedback you get from, from shoppers when you're in this kind of environment. You know, in many areas of the country, there are very limited online opportunities. In a place like Manhattan, there's loads, you have lots of density, so delivery makes more sense. What do the shoppers tell you, and does it worry you? Well, we do, we do different things, because we have, and we're in Manhattan, but it's very much neighborhood stores. We, we're doing online. We have a lot of traffic in the store, but also what we've been doing for years, which still, um, we seem to do more of than even online, is we have people that call the stores, they speak to a specific person, they give the order on the phone, and that person, the same person will shop for that person's order every day. So they get a relationship with the person in the store, and that person knows what that particular person wants, and we deliver it. So, so the answer to high tech is high touch. Have a, have a person who is their friend that they want to interact with and is able to help them. Um, that, that's a, a really interesting thing. Rich, a, a lot of restaurants have had delivery and now there's all these um, you know, food dudes and other guys that are, are delivering things. And there seems to be a cultural shift. You know, Eric was mentioning uh, that they have this real one-hour one hour delivery uh, service. And I know in my employees, looking at them, some of the younger people, it's, they expect I want a sandwich, and they expect someone to just bring them one sandwich right then and there. It's, it's a, a very interesting um, cultural shift. Um, and it seems like it could lead to a lot more uh, purchases. I don't know if it'll make money, but it, it could lead to more purchases. Do, do you hear from restaurants that this is becoming a significant part of their business? I mean, so, yeah, I don't know. I have two, uh, like, 18, 20-year-old at home, and they did that the other day. And I, all I know is we got two large pieces, and I paid 60 bucks. So somebody's, <laughs> somebody's probably making a living somewhere on it. But there's no doubt that uh, the generational group that's coming up today has an immediacy that we can't even recognize uh, because everything that they want is at their fingertips and that's their expectation is is that so if they they, they if, if they want to be able to shop at any restaurant and get any food there's a number of apps that you can go on and have it delivered um, it's all about convenience so uh, one way or another, Jim, I think that in all of our industries, uh, we're going to find that we're going to have to deliver a very finite service to people in a fast way, in a very high quality, in a safe manner. Everything that we preach uh, as an industry, uh, we're, we're going to have to find that convenience for people because the expectation is there in all of our other products. I mean, Amazon Prime right now, uh, you know, it's Amazon Prime now, you can go shopping and get things in two hours, or, you know, even one day or two days. That's the expectation people have, and I, I believe if we don't find a way to convert and graduate to that kind of thinking with Fresh, we'll be left behind, uh, because that's just the cultural uh, uh, folks that are coming up in our world right now. So we have to find a way to address that, all of us. You know, um it makes me think, um, Anthony, 
it sounds like retailing is becoming e even more complicated than it was, having to wrestle with different types of competitors, different sizes of stores. Um, and one of the things that CNS kind of does for people is it says, we'll let you concentrate on all those things and we'll handle a lot of the back end of, of this. Could you make an argument for that? Does that make sense? Could we see an industry where um, retailers are refocusing on consumer needs in different ways and leaving a lot of logistics and things to, to a company like yours? Uh, absolutely. I, I, I think that um, you should have two separate entities. I think that retailers um, should focus, and it's important for them to focus, on the consumer, um, providing to their needs and allowing uh, a, a back-end supply chain like a, a CNS or <coughs> uh, another wholesale distributor um, to focus and, and be the supply chain expert because there is a savings there and we can take costs out of the system for the retailer to be more competitive and to differentiate to their consumer. You know, Marianne, I, I was at, at an event, Joe Procacci's in the room and uh, it, it was to honor him, uh, I guess a couple years ago, and um, one of the things that really um, struck me was a, a, a whole team from, um, from Wakefern flew down, they bought a couple of tables, and they were part of honoring this supplier relationship. That didn't immediately strike me as something every retailer in America would do, but it seemed that Wakefern felt um, that there was a different kind of connection with at least some of its suppliers mm -hmm. uh, than people often talk about retailers having. Could you speak to a little bit about the way work, Wakefern might think about those types of relationships? Um, sure, we have a great relationship with Joe Procacci. We have a great relationship with a lot of vendors um, of that nature. We keep each other alive all year when a vendor needs to move product, we have an outlet to do that for them. When we need product and it's tight, we rely on them. And it's a, it's a very day-to-day -day balance that develops those kind of relationships where someone is honored, we're, we're honored to be part of that as well. Josh, are, are your stores thinking about you in the way that Marianne is saying she's thinking about suppliers? Uh, uh, do they feel um, dependent and integrated with what you're doing or, or, or do they sort of feel they want to go their own way on a lot of things? Well, you know, we try to, as Krasil, try to provide some of the resources, uh, whether it be category managing or trying to pick certain SKUs that we believe um, will benefit uh, increasing uh, produce business. At the end of the day, the store owners can take those resources and use them or not use them. Um, again, they like to be independents. Um, uh, they like to go and, um, of course, they'll pick my head once in a while and then ask me some questions on certain things. But at the end of the day, they like to pick and choose what they want to do with their stores. And, and, you know, a testament to them, you know, basically they know those neighborhoods. Um, they know how to cater to that, their clientele. And so, therefore, um, you know, basically by giving them the resources there, they use that and use sort of the knowledge of the neighborhood and just bring it all together. Right. Just... just we're, we're almost out of time as we're going to head on down to the trade show. But Vic, if I could ask you to talk a little bit about your decision to get engaged with the Eastern Produce Council. You, you have all these stores, you've got all these vendors, um, and of course you're all united in this desire to increase sales and profits, and that, that's what it's all for. Yet you've come to see and to, to feel, and some of the other people here are very involved with EPC too, that collective action and collective integration uh, is part of the tool to make that happen. How did you make that decision and has it worked for you? The decision was easy because the first time I went to um, an EPC meeting, um, I, maybe 25 years ago, um, I was blown away by it. I was blown away by the industry. I was blown away by, by the heritage and the people, um, the characters that were in the room, the entertainment value, and then the information that you got by being there. You know, it, it, it was like a micro session. It was like speed dating, you know, talking to all these different vendors and getting all this information. So it was very easy to decide that I wanted to be part of um, the Eastern Produce Council. And, um, 
I'm sorry, what was the second phase of the question, Jim? I, I wanted to know if it worked for you and how. Uh, yeah, abso absolutely works for, for me, and I think it works for our industry. And, you know, I'll, I'll take one example of something that happened very recently that we all stood together and um, we had a, a common opinion and we worked together and, and, um, and we solved the problem. And, and it was, um, it was the um, New Jersey Board of Agriculture's attempt to put um, some limitations on the word local um, in the state of New Jersey. And um, I'm not opposed to that if done in, in, in the right manner. And um, you know, we as retailers, really collectively through our meetings together at the EPC and our conversations, we all got together and agreed that this was something that we needed to fight collectively together. Um, not with each individual company's um, attorneys or, or any other means, but letting the growers know from us that this wasn't something that was going to work for us, that this was something that potentially could damage the program. Um, and when we spoke to them in that way, collectively, as a group, we were able to keep that from happening. Um, so I see a huge value in us working together and being together and um, having a, a collective opinion and voice, and I think it's very important to us and to the industry and to produce sales in the end. Well, and in fact, sharing ideas, sharing information, trying to come up with new strategies, uh, these are all the things that strengthen us individually in our careers, that strengthen our companies, and that strengthen the industry as a whole. And uh, we really have to give a great thanks. All 10 people on this panel didn't have to be here today. All of them really have other things they could do, many demands on their time. So we're very, very grateful that you chose to help us and help the industry today. And we thank you so very much for being part of this uh, event.